I've got no idea why I'm doing this. You know what a pinch of salt looks like, but you can just do that and um, it changes everything. Welcome everybody to uh, a channel all about improving your photography. Well, mostly. What this, this is, uh, this is electrolytes. Cheers. I've, uh, I've just been for a run. As per government guidelines, I've tried to uh, take the minimum amount of time possible outside, which basically means I've run about twice as fast as I'm actually capable of running for my fitness levels. So if I start screaming with cramps, please, um, please phone an ambulance. Don't actually at the moment. No, that, that wouldn't go down very well. If you're watching this in two years time, it's currently the coronavirus lockdown. Do you remember that? Right, anyway, as I've said a couple of times on this channel before, I have pretty much had enough of photography tip list videos. Um, so today what I thought I'd do is another one. But this one's a little bit different. This one is basically my, my sort of greatest hits. Maybe the only hits that I've had, to be honest. I think in the hundred plus videos that I've done on this channel, most of the stuff that I've ever said has been complete nonsense. But I think completely by accident, I have stumbled across some nuggets of wisdom over the course of all those hours of footage. And today what I thought I'd do is condense all the stuff I've said that I think is actually quite good into one video. And I can maybe announce them like a radio DJ, you know? I made it 10, it was gave you a new shingle. No, I won't do that. Also, there's not 10, there's only nine. Right, first tip I've given that I think is actually quite a good one is that I think the aim should always be to make photos that are about things rather than just of things, which is a bit of a strange thing to think about. And uh, it's certainly not black and white. And I don't mean black and white in terms of photography. I mean black and white in terms of theory. There's a lot of gray in this. Basically, there's no hard and fast definition of what makes a photo of something or what makes a photo about something. I just think you should try and make photos more about something than of something. I can see you looking at me thinking, what the hell's he going on about if you've not seen me talk about this before? Let me try and explain through photos. So this is a photo of Lake Bled. I think it's a photo of Lake Bled. And here is a photo about Lake Bled or certainly more about Lake Bled than the other one. And what makes this photo more about Lake Bled is the fact that I feel like I'm in the middle of a story when I look at this image. So I get a sense that people visit this island. I get a sense that we're in like a calm, serene environment because there's a lovely reflection on the lake. I get the sense that I'm surrounded by trees because you can see branches in the corner of the frame. I get a sense of temperature because of the mist and the autumn leaves. And so in general, I think this does a much better job of uh, being about something rather than just of something, which as I said, I think is always the aim with photography. Uh, another example, so this is an ice fisherman in Greenland, and I could have, for this photo, just gone right up tight to him and taken a photo, basically filled the frame with his body. And through doing that, tried to get lots of detail of the, um, I don't know, what's he using to the spear thing to get through the ice. That could have been the aim with the photo. But by doing that, you wouldn't have got the sense of scale that you get by me standing much further back and including all of the ice that you see in this photo. And by doing that, you get much more of a sense of what is going on, what the scene is about than if you just saw the fisherman. For example, you can see that there is no other person for miles around other than me taking the photo. But there's no people, there's no industry. And by showing that, you get a much better sense of, for example, what his life is like. And uh, you wouldn't get that, like I said, if you, if you framed it differently, if you just got a photo of him. And this, I think, is a photo about him. Similarly with this one from the same trip, this is uh, dog sledding, as you can see. Now, if the whip wasn't included in this photo, then it would just be a photo of my feet and a person in front of me on a dog sled. By including the whip, you get a sense of urgency. You get the impression that this man maybe owns the dogs. You get the impression that maybe he's working. You get much more of a sense of what's going on in the frame just by including that whip. So yeah, having photos that are about things rather than just of things is a bit of a strange thing to wrap your head around, but it's certainly something good to aim for. Also, quick intermission. Here is three seconds of drone footage to remind us all of what going outside is like. 
Okay, number two, a bit of a strange one again, um, seasoning your photos. Now, when you eat food, say you've got a big plate of, I don't know, spaghetti in front of you, sometimes it can look the absolute works and just taste, well, quite bland. Really. And in such situations, you might find that adding some salt to your food, a, a pinch of salt, can do it the world of good. You can just do that and um, it changes everything. Too much of it is an absolute disaster, but just a little bit, a pinch, can do it the world of good. Photography, I find, can be exactly the same. And let me explain again with examples. So here's a photo from that same Greenland trip that was productive for the sake of this video. And uh, as you can see, my friend Ulanak is walking towards this iceberg. Now, were he not there, the photo would be entirely different. I mean, it'd basically be a photo of an iceberg. But by putting him there, despite the fact that he is a tiny percentage of the overall frame, you get a much better sense of story just because you start thinking to yourself, what on earth is he doing there? And that is the start of curiosity with an image. And uh, it changes everything as soon as you have questions about an image. And just a little bit of seasoning, i.e. something small in the frame to make you question things, can do a photo of the world of good. Uh, here's another example of it, me in the Faroe Islands with my big orange jacket on. Again, I'm a tiny part of the frame, but you start thinking, oh, how on earth did he get there? Car and a bit of a walk is how I, how I got there. Doesn't always have to be people. I mean, it works quite well with people in this sense. I mean, this is another one from Italy with Tom. And again, if I remove him, the photo is not the same. It's just a, a photo of a mountain. But as soon as you have a person there, you get a much better sense of adventure. Uh, here's an example with some birds. So without these birds, this is just a photo of some mist and a nice lake on a winter's morning. With the birds, I think at least you get a sense of story, again, despite the fact that they are a tiny percentage of the frame. Tip number three is how to take photos faster or to stop missing photos. Now the photos that I've shown you so far, a lot of those I could have quite easily missed, to be honest. They were very split second moments in time that I was just ready to take photos of. And all it takes in situations like that is a little bit of pre-planning to make sure that you and your camera are ready. So the most important thing is for you to be ready in situations like that. And what I try to do is anticipate. So quite often, for example, I will see, um, the birds coming, for example. I'll see them in the distance and I'll think, oh no, I'm not ready to take a photo yet. And I'll try and track where in the sky they're going and I'll try and work out where they'll be in 20 seconds time when I am ready to take a photo and I'll plan to get them in that 20 seconds time. A um, couple of examples of this. So this is the Matterhorn in Switzerland and some parachuters, paragliders. Don't know what they're called. Is that paragliding? Which one's the one where you're on like a motorized thing and you've got the triangle above you? It doesn't matter. I saw these two and thought, oh my word, I've missed them. And then I tracked them in the sky, worked out that I would be able to get a shot of them with the Matterhorn. It gave me time to work out my focal length and what my settings needed to be. And about 15 seconds after I saw them, I got a shot of them. Uh, here's an example of a bloke on Newbra Beach in Wales. I spotted him down the beach and tried to work out where I'd be able to get a photo of him in 20, 30 seconds time. That gave me time to adjust my settings and to frame a composition. I waited for him to come into the frame, Bang. So yeah, as far as making sure that you don't miss many shots, anticipation is crucially important. I also use a custom setting, a custom profile in my camera that I can flip to where I know settings will broadly be what I'm after. And then I'll need to make fewer adjustments than I otherwise would in a setting that wasn't set up for that. So I think I mentioned in the video that I was talking about this in, uh, but typically I'm at F4 in this custom profile, just because that's plenty bright enough. And I know that I'll be able to get pretty much all of my subject, pretty much all of the time in focus. I'll have my shutter speed set to a 200th of a second, which is usually plenty fast enough to get even moving subjects sharp. And I'll be an auto ISO. Now, if I'm in really bright scenes, then a 200th of a second shutter speed sometimes won't be fast enough to get a properly exposed image. But if that's the case, all I need to do is make some quick adjustments on the back dial of my camera to bring down the exposure, quicken the shutter speed, and I'm good to go. That is a lot less adjustment than I'd otherwise have to make if I was just in aperture priority and I'd been shooting something else previously. So having a custom profile set up on my camera for this is a really big deal that has helped me stop missing as many photos as I otherwise would. Number four, jigsaw. I'm going mad at home. 
to be honest. So this is one I spoke about just a few weeks ago, actually, and it was about a, uh, a tip that somebody gave me right at the start of my photography journey while I was in New Zealand, uh, taking photos of a tree in Wanaka, which has sadly been destroyed, not destroyed. Uh, someone has cut the branch off it, which is a horrific thing to do. That thing is like such an icon for New Zealand and someone's just tried to destroy it for seemingly no reason whatsoever. Horrible. Anyway, a stranger told me that his number one tip for photography was to stop looking for completed jigsaw puzzles and instead just look for individual jigsaw pieces. So to demonstrate this, here is a photo of Tom in Slovenia. Now it's rare as photographers, I find, that you come across a scene that is just a perfect photograph. More often, you come across bits of what you think will make a perfect photograph, and then it's your job to try and figure out how to make them a photograph. This is a good example of it. You've got the mountains, you've got the river, you've got the very slightly autumnal trees, and you've got Tom. Putting all those things together was my job that afternoon. And as soon as I had those individual pieces in my mind, I could try and work out how to piece them together to create a photo. If you're constantly just looking for what looks like a photo in front of your eyes, you're unlikely to find as much stuff as if you're willing to kind of manipulate bits and pieces and walk around trying to find how to slot each individual item together. Number five, why you should shoot with JPEGs. Now, if you've been around photography blogs or even photography videos like this, you'll have probably heard that it's good to shoot raw because those files are much more manipulatable that's definitely not a word. Raw files basically are uncompressed data, so you can do a lot more with raw files than you can with compressed JPEGs. There's just not as much information in a JPEG to help you manipulate that JPEG so that you can make it look how you want it to look. The trouble is though, if you're not that experienced with photo editing, you can have a raw file and all of a sudden you start doing splits with the sliders in Lightroom, and before you know it, your photo looks absolutely disgusting. Shooting raw plus JPEG means that you can use the JPEG as a guide for how you want to start editing your raw files. And I find it can be a really good exercise to try and edit your raws to look like the JPEGs that your camera has produced. Because I find once you do that, well then you're probably competent enough to start editing of your own accord without the need for a, a guide JPEG. But until that's the case, having a JPEG that you can use as a guide is a really useful thing, I think. And in that video that I talk about this in, I show you how in Lightroom you can set up the JPEG as a reference um, image and you can edit them side by side. Number six is exercise, not that kind of exercise. So I find one of the best photography practices to be going out with a single lens, preferably a prime if you have one, and trying to find images at just that one focal length. I find giving yourself restrictions like that really helps hone your concentration and work out what you can get in a frame, but also what you're not able to get in a frame. And that, just thinking about compositions much more intensely, I find to be a really good exercise and a way to improve your composition skills. So yeah, every now and then I like to get out with either a 25 mil, which is a full frame equivalent of 50 mil, or maybe my little 15 mil, which is a 30 mil full frame equivalent. I like to get out with those lenses, and just those lenses, and try and work out how to get photos with those. And even if I can't, it's not the end of the world, it's just a practice and I'll have learnt things by at least trying to get photos at those focal lengths. If you haven't got a prime, just use a zoom and just keep it to one focal length. There's salt everywhere now. Um, tip number seven is golden hour, or not golden hour, not always having to shoot in golden hour. So a lot of photography advice uh, seems to suggest that you can only really get photos in good light. Now good light is one thing to take a photo of, it's one element of a story that can help to make a good photo. But it's by no means the only element that you can take photos of to make a story. And I've got lots of photos that I'm proud of that have been taken at golden hour, but they're not always the defining feature of the photo. And to be honest, I find that like anything in life, if you see too much of something, you'll get bored of it. And I have certainly got to that point with golden hour photography. Any image where the light, the golden hour light is the star of the show in that image. To be honest, I've got to a point where I personally find it cliche more often than not. I find it boring. And if I see it on Instagram, it's the sort of thing that I'll scroll past without any second thought. Light or good light is one potential subject there are plenty of other things to take photos of. And if you take too many of your photos in golden hour, or you look at too many photos of golden hour, you might find that you end up the same as me, just 
bored of those kinds of photos. Uh, number eight is back button focusing, the importance of back button focusing. Now I think focusing and taking a photo should be treated as two separate things. And chances are that your camera by default treats them as pretty much the same thing. I mean, you'll half press your shutter button to focus and then you'll fully press it to take a photo. I think by using back button focusing and separating those two things, you get lots of advantages. Primarily, that you don't have to worry about taking accidental photos. And you can focus, recompose, and then take a photo, which for me and my style of photography is invaluable. So yeah, lots more in this video up here, but if you've never tried back button focusing, give it a go. I've never met anyone who hasn't really liked it. I mean, it takes some adjustment, but it changed the way I take photos for the better, definitely. And number nine, finally, is uh, well, what I called, I think, the photography paradox or something like that. And basically what that is, is, um, well, it's about not listening to photography tips. So the trouble with photography is that I don't necessarily think you can learn it. Actually, that's not true. You can learn photography or you can learn to take photos in the same way that other people take photos. For example, if you employ all of the tips that I've spoken about today, you'll probably end up working in a more similar manner to how I work. Thing is, who's to say that I'm doing it the right way? Because photography is an art, and therefore in theory, there is no right way. So by all means, experiment with the tips that you come across in this video and other videos, in blogs, in wherever. Experiment with them, but keep in mind that it doesn't mean that you won't find a better way to do things of your own accord. Because like I said, there is no right way, there's no wrong way, and keeping that in mind ultimately will be beneficial to your process and probably your photos as well. Ultimately, I've not got a clue what I'm talking about, nor has anyone else that you'll listen to. We're all just muddling along, trying to work out how we want to take photos. And if you don't want it to, there's no reason that that should impact how you take photos, because like I said, you might find your own way, which could be immeasurably better than what anyone else has told you previously. Uh, so yeah, that's that. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you stay insane indoors and um, I'll see you soon. Cheers.